All right, good, good morning, everyone. Good to see you in the Lord's house. If you Facebook friends, I honor having you also. Thank you for joining us. Uh, praise the Lord for the rain. Amen. We've got to give God the glory with everything, even the rain. And what the rain should remind us, showers of blessings. Amen. Showers of blessings. God's been good to us. So if you turn to page uh, 296, you're able to stand, grab a hymn book in front of you, and let's sing this song together on page 296. Follow on. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I will follow on. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus everywhere he leads me. I will follow on. You can't go wrong by following Christ. He will never mislead you. So he could be trusted. He will guide you to the right path. So he's the one that we need to follow wholeheartedly. So again, page 296. Let's sing these three verses of this song. Think about the words. Follow on. God wants to hear us sing.
would follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I would follow on, follow, follow. I would follow Jesus everywhere he leads me. I would follow on. Amen. Please be seated for our second hymn this morning which is number 310 in our song books. Hymn number 310, Footprints of Jesus. Hymn number 310, Footprints of Jesus. James, Brother Jared, thank you for cutting the grass. Appreciate that. And the, the rest of the cleaners, thank you for keeping the Lord's house clean. Thank you for the teamwork. And we, we still have some of these Bible reading schedules. If anybody is anybody interested in, in, in these Bible reading schedules, it's a good way to start. You know, have a plan. This will guide you a plan, how to read the Bible in a year. If you're interested, go see one of the ushers. They, they, they're carrying some of them in their pockets. So if you're interested, see one of the ushers, and they'll be happy to give you one of these Bible uh, reading schedules. And let me mention again about the uh, Summit uh, Conference. They do it every year in Solid Rock Baptist Church in Berlin, New Jersey. It's about an hour and a half from here, South Jersey. And it's on July 26th to 28th. It's uh, Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday, the whole conference, and uh, it's pretty exciting. I've uh, been there so many times. It's very encouraging. I encourage you to go if, you're, if, if your uh, schedule allows it. Uh, it. You will be blessed. You will be richly blessed. And um, if you want to know more information about it, uh, uh, it's on, just go to northeastvision.org. Northeastvision.org. If you've got any questions about it, you could talk to me after the service. 
and I'll be happy to give you the information, but uh, any more information concerning that, northeastvision.org. Uh, a few Wednesdays ago, I mentioned when we, when we prayed Wednesday night, I mentioned about one of the missionaries that we support, Brother Quincy in Ukraine. Remember, Ukraine is really going through it with that war. And, you know, I asked Brother Mark Quincy and his wife how they're doing because they're not there. They, the place where they were is kind of destroyed. But there's still some of the people there, some of the churches that he ministered, uh, some of the churches that lost a lot of the members. They're fleeing for their life. But there's still some around that are still... Uh, serving the Lord there, and he keeps in touch with them, Brother uh, Quincy, and he, uh, I said, anything we could do as a church, anything that we could help with the humanitarian needs of those pastors and those Christians over there, he said, oh yeah. So I know that I mentioned that last time, and somebody uh, helped from this church, and I want to say thank you. But we're planning to send them some financial help. If, you, if anybody's interested in helping, uh, you know, you, it's, it's still going to be written to Brother Quincy, but in the memo, if, you, if you're if you writing a check or whatever, you want to write uh, that is to help with the pastors with the humanitarian needs in, in Ukraine. Okay, that's the need, helping the pastors uh, uh, with the humanitarian needs in, in, in Ukraine. Of course, Brother Quincy is the one that's going to uh, deliver the money to them. So if, you, if you're really interested, then you could just, uh, uh, you know, give it to Diane. Even if there's cash or whatever, everything that comes in for them, we will send it to them. And I think that will be a blessing. There's a lot of those families that are struggling with food and clothing. And um, so appreciate that and continue to keep them in prayer. So men, will you come? And we're going to take the offering. And I always say this, that the offering is just for the regular people here, if you're a visitor, uh, let the play pass by. This is for the regular people here, so let's just pray and ask the Lord to meet with us. We need his help and we need his presence. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for another day that the Lord have made. Let us rejoice in it. Thank you that our feet touched the ground this morning, Lord. We're breathing God's air. The Bible said, let everything that have, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Psalm 150, I think the last verse, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And Lord, we're breathing God's air. We're alive because of God's grace, and we need to praise the Lord this morning. We need to give God the glory. And that's why we're here, Lord, to bring honor and glory to your name. Everything we do, eat, and drink, we're supposed to do it all for the glory of God. I pray that you bless Brother Quincy, Lord, and um, the people in Ukraine, the Christians that are there that are struggling. I pray you protect them and provide for them, and, and Lord, use our church to be a blessing to them, and Lord, we just pray that you bless the offering, bless the giver. Uh, the Bible tells us that God loves it, a cheerful giver. It is more blessed to give than to receive, and I pray you bless those cheerful givers here. Bless them, Lord, and I pray that you bless the, uh, the songs, the most important part of the service, the preaching of your word. I pray you help us not to miss the message. Help me to deliver in power, demonstration in power and spirit. Help Carmen as she translate. Lord, I pray you protect us from any distractions. I pray that uh, everything will run smooth here for the glory of God, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray this. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our third hymn this morning, which is number 110 in our song books. Hymn number 110, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Divine 
God's Word, which is in the book of John, chapter 21, the last chapter of the book of John, chapter 21, looking at verses 18 through 21. The Gospel of John, in chapter, one, chapter 21, looking at verses 18 through 21. So there in the book of John, looking in chapter 21, starting in verse 18, the word of God reads, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Amen. Please be seated. There, trying to figure out. None of those microphones are on there. So maybe it was that speaker there shut it off. I don't hear it anymore, so we'll figure it out later. But this morning, John chapter 21 and verses 18 to 23 is, is when our message is coming from those verses, and I want to talk to you this morning about our main business is to follow Jesus. That should be our main business, our main focus, is to follow Jesus. I want you to look with me in John chapter 21, in verse 20 there. Then Peter, turning about, see the disciples whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved. John, I believe the apostle John, this is, I believe he's referring to the apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John the apostle was overwhelmed by the love of Christ. He was overwhelmed by the love of Christ. The disciple whom Jesus loved, and by the way, we should be overwhelmed by the love of Christ. Because just like Jesus loved John, guess what? He loves you. He loves me. He loves his children deeply, amen? And 
Paul, even the apostle Paul was overwhelmed by the love of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 14, Paul said, for the love of Christ constraining us. He was overwhelmed by the love of Christ. The love of Christ just compels us. The love of Christ just motivates us to serve him. We love him because he first loved us. And the love of Christ has transforming power. Amen. And we should never forget that it was love that nailed him to the cross. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was love that nailed him to the cross, and John was just overwhelmed by the love of Christ. But the Gospel of John is the only Gospel which mentions the phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That phrase is mentioned five times, and is only mentioned in the book of John. It's mentioned in John chapter 13, verse 23. John chapter 19, verse 26. It's mentioned in John chapter 20, verse 2. John chapter 21, verse 7. And it's also mentioned in John chapter 21, in verse 20, because the book of John is anonymous. The name, the, no, there's no name of his author. No name of his author is given. The name is omitted. And I think the reason is the humility of the author. The humility of the author. But I want you to notice in John chapter 21, in verse 2, it tells us here who was fishing with Peter. He let us know in John chapter 21 in verse 2 that who was fishing with Peter because you can't really, uh, you know, it's easy to kind of figure out. It doesn't say that the apostle whom Jesus loved, or that the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved, that it was John. But you can kind of put it together, comparing verses with verses, because he did not really introduce himself as, the, uh, uh, as John. But you can kind of put it together when you look at other scriptures. But in John chapter 21 in verse 2, he let us know who was fishing with Peter. Let me read to you John chapter 21, verse 2. They were together, Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other of his disciples. Now, who were the sons of Zebedee? Who were the sons of Zebedee? Well, Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 it tells us this. And going on from thence, he saw all their two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father. And then in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 2, it says, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So we know from there, from those verses, that the sons of Zebedee were two, right? James and John. So we know that John was the son of Zebedee. So also we need to keep in mind that there were three disciples who were especially close to Jesus. They belonged to the intimate circle with Jesus. I mean, they really had a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they wanted that relationship. By the way, we should want a real close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us could really, really be close in a very personal, intimate way with Christ if you really want it. If you really hunger for it and you pursue it, you could have it. And there were three in the Bible that had a very close relationship with Christ. They just stood out from the rest. They, were, uh, uh, they belonged to an intimate circle with Jesus, and that's Peter, James, and John. In Matthew chapter 17... You know the story when Jesus was transfigured before them when he took Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus was transfigured before them. The story there in Matthew chapter 7, it says that Jesus uh, was transfigured before them, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus' face was shining as the sun. And the Bible said that his raiment was white as light, his clothing. Can you imagine? That, that had to be some incredible sight and Peter James and John saw Jesus transfigured before them and of course Jesus was talking heaven opened up and he was having a conversation with Moses 
and Elias, talking about the death of Christ. So I say that because who was there? Peter, James, and John. The three disciples that had this, they were, uh, uh, belonged to this intimate circle with Jesus in Mark chapter 5, in verse 37, it says this in Mark 5, 37, and he suffered. That word suffer means uh, uh, allow. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John. He suffered, he allowed no man to follow except Peter, James, and John. So the disciple whom Jesus loved could not be Peter. It could not be Peter because in John chapter 21, we read in verse 20 that Peter, turning about, see the disciple whom Jesus loved following. So that leaves us with James and John left. And I want you to look with me in John chapter 21, look at verse 18. John chapter 21, verse 18. Jesus, uh, the Bible says in John 21, verse 18, Verily, verily, I said unto thee, When thou wast young, thou guardest thou guarded thyself, and walkest whether thou wouldest. So Jesus, talking to Peter here, is telling Peter that he is to become, he's predicting his death. That's what he's doing, predicting how he's going to die. He, he's telling Peter that he's going to become a martyr. He's going to die for the faith. And when Peter was younger, he had a great freedom of movement. He went where he wished. He did what he wished. But now the Lord was his Savior. Now the Lord was his Lord who had control of his life. And the Lord told him, goes on in verse 18 there, But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. So the Lord told him, that at the end of his life, he will be martyred. In other words, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be bound, and carry off to execution. That's not good news. <laughs> the Lord, and it happened, by the way. He predicted how he's going to die. That prediction of Jesus came to pass. Because church history tells us that Peter was tied to a cross, and his hand stretched out, and he was crucified upside down. Church history tells us that. I want you to notice in verse 19, John chapter 21, notice in verse 19 there, this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. So that kind of death, ugly, nasty death, will bring glory to God. God said, I'm, I'm, that's going to glorify me. Thank you. Of course, he didn't waver. He didn't waver. And notice in verse 20 there, in verse 20, then Peter turned about. See the disciple who Jesus loved, follow him, which also lead on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed thee? Verse 21, Peter seeing him say to Jesus, Lord, and why should this man do think about that that, that that statement he just he just predicted Peter how he's gonna die a martyr's death he's gonna be taken he's gonna be executed for the faith and then now we see here Peter said Lord why should this man do so Simon Peter said no now Lord you already told me what I'm going to do tell me about John what he's going to do you already told me my future. How about John? Look at John chapter 21. Again, in verse 22, look at it again. Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Verse 23, then when this saying abroad, when I brought the brethren, that the disciple should not die, Jesus said not unto him that he should not die, but if... I will that he tarry until I come. What is that to thee? So our Lord is saying, look, Simon Peter, you're going to die for me. You're going to die for me. What John does is none of your business. That's what really he's saying. 
It's really none of your business, even if he lives until I return. That does not affect what you are to do, which is you got to follow me. And by the way, he said it twice for emphasis. Church history tells us that the apostle Peter died as a martyr. 34 years later, after Jesus' prediction in Rome, he refused to be crucified like Jesus. And he said, I want to be crucified upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. Now, church history also tells us that the apostle John lived into the 90s, which means he outlived the rest of the apostles. That's what church history tells us, that he, the apostle John lived into the 90s and was the last surviving apostle. John was the last living apostle and died of all age. He outlived the rest. Jesus made a statement about the, the possibility of the longevity of the life of the disciple whom Jesus loved. And um, by the way, John was the youngest of the apostles. He was the youngest and died at, a, at, at the oldest age. He outlived the rest. He was the only one that escapes all kinds of dangers of persecution and death that they tried to kill him. And church history tells us that he was taken to Rome and he was thrown to a cauldron of hot boiling oil. And he survived that. God was with him. I mean, they wanted to kill him like they killed the rest, but he survived that. He experienced a natural death in Ephesus over 90 some years old. They said it was about to 94 years old. So that, you know, that prediction could not be James. Remember the three, these Peter, James, and John? Could not be James because, you know, about living a long life. It could not be James because in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible tells us that Herod killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And he was the first apostle that died as, an, as a martyr. So this was referring to John. Look at that again in verse 20. John chapter 21, verse 20. Then when Peter turned about, see the disciple whom Jesus loved follow him, which also lead on his breast at supper, said, Lord, which is he that breathed thee? Peter seen him and said to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? So when Peter saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, he probably still had in his mind Jesus' prophecy regarding his death as a martyr. And I believe that prompted Peter to ask, what will happen to John? And I believe he could have asked that because of his deep concern for John's future since they were buddies. That was an intimate friend. So he, it was a legitimate question. He was concerned about his friend John. They were, that was his intimate friend. What should this man do? What will happen to John? Is he going to die like me? And then notice how Jesus responded in verse 22. If I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee? So Jesus did not reveal what will happen to John. He simply said that if it, is, if it was his will for John not to die soon and live a long, useful life or service, that did not affect Peter's service or Peter's main obligation, which is to follow Jesus. So Jesus replied, follow thou me. He mentioned it twice in verses 19, and he mentioned it again in verse 22. So follow thou me, that means, that signifies that his primary concern must not be for John's future, but his continued devotion to the Lord and his service. His main business was to follow Jesus Christ. And by the way, that should be our main business, Amen. Our main business is to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, not keeping our eyes on somebody else's life, not comparing ourselves with others. Our main duty and obligation is to keep our eyes on Christ. That's a lesson for us, amen? And I think that's where we fail many times because when you, you, get, when you get your eyes on the Lord and start looking at other Christians, you know what's going to happen? Two things. You're going to get discouraged because you don't think I'm as spiritual as that person. Oh, you're going to get proud because you think, look, I'm really, uh, I'm a super Christian. And that's dangerous. That is very dangerous. Jesus said unto him in verse 22, if, if I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee? If John lived until his second coming, it was none of Peter's business. He needed to live his own life in faithfulness to God, not to compare himself with others. So his main concern was to follow the steps of Christ, not follow the steps of John. Amen? And I, 
you know, that's pretty dangerous when we compare ourselves. The Bible condemns that. The Bible says that that's not wise when you compare yourself with other people. Amen? The one that we need to compare ourselves is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And every time I compare myself with him, I realize I need improvement. I got a long way to go. Amen? But that's the perfect example that we must follow. We could never become perfect like Christ, but that'll be our goal. He's our example. Amen? Looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, I think it's verse 2, 1. So that's to be our main concern. And if you, I want you to go to 2nd, don't lose your power, but go to 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 12 because this shows the mark of Paul's, the Apostle Paul's humility. The Apostle Paul refused to compare himself with others he refused to engage himself in self-promotion. You know that Paul hesitated, was very reluctant about talking about himself? Paul liked to brag about Christ. He liked to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's times that he had to talk about himself and he was hesitant about doing it to defend his ministry because of his false accusation that were accusing him that he was doing it for money. He was like a money-grabbing preacher. And Paul, to defend his, his apostleship, he had to talk about himself a little bit, you know? And, but Paul, he, 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 didn't, he didn't think it was wise to compare yourself with us. That's why we see Peter. He's comparing himself with John. The Lord told him, are you going to die? How about him? Can you tell me his future? It's none of your business. Your job is to follow me. Don't follow John's step. Follow my steps. Amen? And that's a lesson for us. Amen? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, look at what the apostle Paul says. He says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. It's not wise, amen? It's not wise because, again, you could easily get discouraged or you could get proud. Two things happen when we compare ourselves. Too many people think that they're like, you know, God's gift to the world. They're like spiritual giant. Nobody's a spiritual giant here. You know who's the spiritual giant? Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Stay humble, amen? Hey, I must decrease, he must increase, John the Baptist says. And John was a great man of God, right? No greater man than John the Baptist, born among women. He was great in God's sight, the best man that ever lived, but he never promoted himself. John said, I must decrease, he must decrease. I must become less important. He must become more important. It's not about me. It's about him, Christ. Amen? It's not about us. It's about Christ. So it is only by God's grace that he's using us. Amen? We don't deserve to be used, but it's only by the grace of God. And the apostle Paul's main concern was what the Lord thought of him. And our main concern ought to be what the Lord thinks of us. Amen? Because he's the one that we got to give account to. He's the one that keeps, you know, keeps records of our life. He's the one that we got to stand before him in the judgment seat of Christ. He's the one that's going to evaluate our service. And I'm sure that if we want, if we really want to focus on the Lord and, 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 and be faithful to him, all of us here will love to hear one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? But the only way that's going to happen, we got to keep our eyes on the Lord. We got to follow Christ's steps. We got to be like Christ. We got to follow the example of Christ and follow his lifestyle. Amen? And that's the only way. But Paul was concerned what the Lord thought of him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 4, the last statement there, Paul says in the last line of 1 Corinthians 4 4, but he that judged me is the Lord. He was more concerned about what the Lord think of you. And that's that to be our, our focus. Amen? So stop worrying about what other people think about you. Worry about what the Lord thinks about you. And make sure that you are pleasing Him. Amen? Make sure that you are obeying Him and you're what you're supposed to be. You're in the center of His will. And you're doing what's right in God's eyes. That should be our main focus. Amen? That should be our main focus. And, you know, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 21, Peter says, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. Talk about Christ. He's leaving us in a great example that we shall follow his steps. 
I mean, if everybody make that your main goal, your main focus, your main business, to focus on Christ, to be like Christ, to follow his example, to follow his steps, man, then you know what? We're going to, we, we, we're going to, all of us are going to be in the right path and we're going to be pleasing the Lord. Amen? But I believe that's a distraction that could really hinder our spiritual growth when we just compare ourselves with one another. And that's not wise, Paul said. But another distraction that Christians do that I believe is when they, they start misinterpreting the word of God and that creates misunderstanding about God's people and God's plan for his people. Because if, if you notice in John, go back to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Notice in verse 22. And Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry until I come. Now, he didn't say that John was going to die at a certain age or whatever. He didn't say that like Peter. He said it's a possibility. If I, if it's my will that, he, that I tarry until he come, that he lives a long life. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. None of your business. Your main business is to follow me. And then he says in verse 23, Then when they saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple, who, that that disciple should not die. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. But if I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee? So they misquote Jesus. And misquoted Jesus' plans for John in the future. He didn't say he was going to die. See how they take it out of context? And, you know, we got to be careful about that's another distraction that Christian, we just, I, I'm thinking of the Word of Faith movement. By the way, I stay away from that movement. I'm thinking about the Word of Faith movement. They are misinterpreting God's work concerning faith and suffering. They tell you that if you're suffering, if you're really suffering or a physical problem or you're really going through some tough time, it's because you're lacking faith. You're not spiritual. You got little faith. And that could really discourage you, amen? And that's a lie from the devil, amen? Because the greatest Christian in the Bible that suffered, all of them, they had great faith. Paul had great faith, amen? And he had struggles. So all, all the apostles that got, got killed for the faith, they suffer, amen? They had a rough. They didn't have it easy. And I believe the more faith you have, the stronger faith, the more you will suffer. The more the devil will irritate you. Amen? All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul told Timothy, amen? So that's a lie. That's misquoting, amen? Look, what is it? I think it's John chapter 9 when the disciples said, Lord, who sinned? That this man is born blind. His parents sin, and Jesus says, no, neither his parents, no. So God, God's work could be manifested in him. Amen? So, look, just because somebody's suffering, stop me. Oh, he, remember Job's, Job's friend? They, they accuse him. Oh, he's in sin. Remember I preached a, a message on that on Job? That was a lie. God condemns them for misquoting God. Amen? Look, that's not, we got to be careful about that. Jesus did not reveal to Peter what will happen to John. But here's something interesting. Ignorance or lack of knowledge is no excuse for not serving the Lord. Some people say that they will not serve the Lord if they cannot get all their questions answered. My friend, there are a lot of things that you won't know. There are many things that you don't need to know. And there are things that are not none of my business or your business to know is only, is only, is only God's business. Amen? The main business is to follow him. The important thing is to follow Christ. That's what we need to focus on. God is not, look, many failures are happening in the Christian life because too many want to question God's authority. That's dangerous, amen? Too many, God gave you the book, amen? Just follow the book. Just, just surrender to his book and his promises and, and continue to live by faith. We walk by faith, amen, by my sight. But too many are questioning God's authority. God is not under no obligation to give us an explanation to what he does. Even the suffering that he allows in Allah, he has no obligation to tell us why he's suffering. You know what we're going to find out when we get to heaven, amen? Because in heaven, we're going to have open vision, perfect vision. In the meantime, we live by faith, amen? God is no, no, no obligation to tell you why. Too many people are asking God why. In fact, I want you to go to a great verse in the Old Testament that talks about this. 
Go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. In verse 29. Old Testament, don't lose your spot, but Deuteronomy chapter 29. In verse 29. Because I want to explain to you that God is under no obligation to give us an explanation why he allowed things in our life, why suffering, why he allowed suffering in our life. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. You're there? Look at what it says. This is a great verse. The secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the works of this law. So they say the secret things belong unto the Lord. There are secret things which God have not revealed to us. There are secret things that God have not revealed to us. God never declares everything to man. There are secret God has and will always have. He has the right to have secrets because he's God. We got we to gotta stop arguing with God and move out of the way and let God be God. Amen. God is bigger than you and I. God is bigger and he is smarter than all of us. We must simply accept by faith that he, whatever he does, he's doing it for our own good. Amen? I mean, we, we, you know what, what we got to accept by faith when we don't understand what God allows suffering in our life? He's not trying to hurt you. He loves you. Don't forget that he loves you. Amen? He, God has a purpose. When we, when we don't understand what God is doing in our life, we must accept by faith Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. You want to hear what Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. That's what we need to do, accept that by faith. Amen? He's way bigger and smarter than us. Deuteronomy 29, 29 said the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us, to our children forever, that we may do all the works of this law. So Moses reminded the people that their responsibility is clearly revealed to do all the works of this law. And you know, all the works of the law are contained in the Bible. Don't, don't be too concerned about the parts that you don't understand. Be concerned about the parts that you understand that are revealed in God's word and you're not obeying. Amen? I mean, right here, we got the book. We got the Bible. Just while you hear preach, live it. That's revealed to us. The things that you don't understand, leave it in God's hand. Because that belongs to the Lord, and he has a purpose. Amen? And he's bigger than us. And live by faith and realize that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are higher than your ways. He's smarter than us. Amen? He's smarter than us. The Bible is an instruction book to guide us through life. We have it right here. That's revealed in scriptures. We have it. James chapter 4, verse 17 tells us, Therefore, to him that knoweth to the good and doeth not to him is sin. So what God has revealed to us in scripture that we know that it's clear that God is the will of God for us to do, then we must do it because if we know that what we need to do, we don't do it, that's sin. That is sin. So, what I learned from experience is that a God that I could understand all the time is not a big God. If I could understand everything about God, I don't need God. I got it all figured out. That's what makes him so awesome, amen? Because we can't understand him. He's, he's too powerful, amen? But we could trust that big, powerful God because he's perfect in all he's doing, amen? In fact, go to Romans chapter 9 for a minute. Go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, and I want you to look at verse 19. Romans chapter 9, verse 19. Because we like to question God's authority, because we don't understand. We want answers, right? And that hinders us from, from trusting the Lord faithfully. And that's the dangerous thing to do, to question God's authority. And in Romans chapter 9, in verse 19, listen to this. Paul says, Thou will say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who have resisted his will? We blame God, we accuse God of not being fair. I'm preaching to myself of not being unloving. 
because he allowed you to go to that heavy trial. Where were you, God? And we blame God. We find fault in God, right? For who have resisted his will? And then it says, Nay, no, O oh man, who art thou that replies? Who are you to argue with God, to question God's authority? So the thing formed, say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Verse 21, Have not the potter over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Who we are? Who are you, lump of clay? You know, you're just a lump of clay. He's the potter, amen? Let him shape you and mold you after his will. Let him make something beautiful out of you, amen, as the master potter. He could make a beautiful product out of you and I. Amen? So we got to stop resisting his will and stop questioning God's authority and let God be God. Amen? What's the clay's responsibility? Cooperate with him. Just yield. Just be surrender, amen? And let God have his way. And that's what we need to do. Many are resisting God's will. God's will at times will take you to places where you don't want to be. God's will took to Peter to a place that was not pleasant. To be executed. Amen? And God's, you, you want to be in God's will? How many of you want to be in God's will? By the way, the best place to be in the center of God's will. Because you're protected. Amen? Amen? And God's will many times will take you to places that are not pleasant. But he's there. You're in the center of God's will. Keep trusting him, amen? Don't doubt his authority. God's will took Peter to be arrested, bound, and carried off to execution. God's will took Job to lose everything. Talk about suffering great loss. You think you have suffered anything? You haven't suffered anything compared to what Job lost. He lost everything. But he was in the center of God's will. He kept trusting the Lord. He kept his main business to follow God. His wife told him, why don't you just drop dead, curse God, and die? Give up, throw in the towel. Give up on life. God doesn't, God's not there for you. She has no faith. But he says, no, he says, you speak like a foolish woman. You know, uh, uh, should we receive good things from the hand of God and, and not evil things? Job did not expect to live a stress-free, problem-free life. His wife did. But not, and by the way, you should not expect to live a stress-free, problem-free life. Amen. We need to trust him. Keep following the Lord. Because his will will take you to places where you don't, where it's not pleasant to be. How about Joseph? It's another good vivid illustration. Joseph, we don't find anything negative about him. He was a man of faith. He followed God wholeheartedly. He trusted the Lord. He didn't question God's authority. You don't find nothing negative about, about Joseph. I'm sure he's sin. He, he's, he's, he's not perfect. But God took Job and God took uh, Peter and Joseph to play. That, that's, God's will took them to places that is not, that we don't enjoy being in those places of what God put us through the fire and trouble. But in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph said this, told his brothers who sold him to slavery, but as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. Isn't that a great verse? By the way, while you call evil, you want God to remove it, the trials and the suffering, the hurt, you know what? What we call evil might be good in God's eyes. And what we call good might be bad for you. Let God decide what's good for you and what's bad for you. Amen? Let God decide that. And Joseph learned to let God decide that. And our job is to follow the Lord. God was working silently behind the scenes. And whatever God is allowed in your life, can I tell you, God has not lost control of your life. God still has a purpose, amen? He wants to fulfill that purpose. And you know what? God is working silently behind the scenes. Amen. God was controlling all the events in their life. They didn't understand, but they kept one business, which is to follow God. And that should be our main business, follow God. Follow thou me, Amen. The will of God never will take you where the grace of God will not protect you. Think about that. The will of God will not take you where the grace of God will not protect you. Let me just give you, go to 1 Peter chapter 4 for a minute. And I'm going to give you three reactions that you and I must face. Must face when we face struggling or suffering in our life or trouble. 
This is the three reactions that you must have when we face suffering in our life. When we don't understand, this is the response that we must have. And it all wrapped up, follow the Lord. Trust the Lord. Don't question God's authority, amen? And um, go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And I want you to notice in verse 13, because Peter is talking about suffering here. He tells us how to respond properly to suffering when we don't understand. And I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Notice in verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 in verse 12. He's talking about the Christian and suffering when we don't understand what's going on and, and why does God allow this suffering. Look at verse 12. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think in that strain concerning the fiery trial. We don't like that, right? How many of you likes trials? Especially those fiery ones. Nobody likes trials, amen? But they're going to come, amen? Nobody likes suffering. Concerning the fiery trial of suffering, which is to to try you, test you. I thought some strange thing happened unto you. We ought to make room for trials and suffering in our life. They're coming, amen? Make room. Don't let, don't let them catch you off guard. You should expect them to come. I don't like them, but I expect them to come. Because God said they're coming to your life. Amen? But then he says in verse 13, But what? Rejoice. And as much as you have partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory should be revealed, you may be glad also with exceedingly joy. Look at jump to verse 16 of that same chapter. But if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. I'm sorry, um, in, in, in um, yeah, verse 16, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. He says, but if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So the first reaction when you face suffering Rejoice in what God is doing in your life through suffering. That's what it says. Because God has a purpose, amen? You don't rejoice in your problem. We don't want to. You rejoice in the Lord. You follow him because he has a purpose, amen? In the Lord. Well, I, I think what is it, Paul, in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord. Oh, where I say, rejoice in the Lord. Not in the certain, not in the problem. Nobody likes a problem. Not because they give you bad news, the doctor, cancer. That's not good news. I don't rejoice in that. You rejoice in the Lord. You follow the Lord because he has a purpose. Amen? But look at 1 Peter chapter 4 now. Look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. It says, But let none of, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a beastly body in other man's matters. And notice verse 15 again. Let none of you suffer as, uh, verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, verse 16, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And I want you to go now to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Now go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. Go back, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. He says, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering, what? Wrongly. For what glory is it? In other words, what, 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 what uh, glorious it is, if when you be buffeted for your faults, in other words, if you're, that word buffeted means if you're being punished for wrongdoing, for your, for your fault, for your sins, he says, what glory is it? You should take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that is acceptable unto God. So what is he saying? Make sure that when you're suffering, it's not because of sin. Now, I just mentioned to you that John chapter 9 talks about that when you suffer, it's not always sin. But sometimes it is sin. Sometimes it is sin that God is trying to chastise us. Amen? If you're suffering, make sure it's not because of sin. If it's for your fall or my fall of sin, then we deserve to suffer. Amen? But he said that if it's for doing right, 
for doing well. You suffer for it. Verse 20 of 1 Peter, you take it patiently, you endure it patiently. This is acceptable with God. God is pleased by that, amen? When we're suffering for doing right, just for righteous sake, for living for the Lord, and we're suffering, and you keep trusting God, God said, that's acceptable to me. I'm very pleased. And God has not abandoned you. He's going to carry you through, amen? He will be there for you. And then verse 20, verse 21, he says, he used Christ our example for even here unto when you are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. And then look at how Christ responds to suffering, who did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged righteously. I mean, Christ also suffered for us. He, he's our example. Jesus, our example, as someone who endured punishment unjustly. It says when he was reviled, Jesus did not revile in return. In his suffering, he committed himself to the Father. He trusted God, the Father. Amen? And look, we're going to suffer for doing right. And we need to have the same attitude of Christ. We need to commit it to the Lord and trust the Lord with our circumstances. That's how Jesus did it. Amen? Didn't he say when he died on the cross, Father, into my soul I commit my spirit? Complete trust in God. And that's what we need to do. So, first, reaction when you and I face suffering, rejoice in what God is doing in your life with suffering. Number two, we need to re-examine your life and ask yourself, am I suffering because of my sin and disobedience? And if he convicts you of any sin, then you and I need to repent and get right. Amen? We need to repent. Number three, go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 4. I want you to go to verse 19. He says this, a great verse. He says, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God. You know not all suffering is according to the will of God? Some suffering is because of sin. Because we brought it upon ourselves, amen? And we are to God's will. Make sure your suffering is for doing right, like Christ did right. That's the suffering that God blesses, amen? That's the suffering that God will intervene. He says, verse, Wherefore let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul to him, well doing, into a faithful creator, amen? That's what Jesus did when he suffered unjustly. He committed to the Lord, to his Father. And that's what we, that's got to be our attitude. So after you re-examine your life and find out that the suffering is not because of sin and disobedience, then you need to keep trusting him, keep following him, because now it's not your problem, it's God's problem. Amen? It's not your problem, it's God's problem. And I believe that God can use our suffering for our good. Remember? Joseph said, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Amen? So, it's not your problem, it's God's problem. He's a faithful creator. Trust him, amen? Trust him. You're in safe hand when you trust him. I'm in safe hand when I trust him, amen? Just make sure that it's not because of sin, amen? And if he does point out some sin, then God is telling you to repent. But if it's not because of that, then leave the problem in God's hand and stop worrying about it. Leave it in God's hand. He could do that better job than you and I. We, we take the problems in our own hand, and that's how we get bent out of shape when we messed up. And we get all depressed. Let God take care of the problem, amen? So go to Mark chapter 7. I told you a great verse. Mark chapter 7, in verse 37. Mark chapter 7, look at this great verse. It's just a phrase there that blew me away. When I don't understand what God is doing in my life and I get discouraged and I just begin in my mind to start questioning God's authority like you do also. In, in Mark chapter 7, I want you to notice in verse 37, the last verse of Mark chapter 7. Look at this great, there's a great phrase that I want you to highlight here because it's pretty profound and powerful. Talk about Christ. Look at verse 37, and we're, and we're beyond measure, our stand is saying, talk about Christ, he hath done all things well. You ought to highlight that. 
You got to underline that in your Bible, amen? Christ has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. When life throws me a punch and I don't understand why certain things have happened in my life, this is the time to anchor myself on the things that I do understand. And one thing I do understand, according to the Bible, he does all things well. Amen? Anchor yourself on that, amen? When you don't understand, don't get discouraged, don't get overwhelmed. It's God's problem if you're doing right. Leave it in God's hand. God's not going to explain to you why he did it. Just trust him, amen? And anchor yourself and realize, whatever is happening, I don't like it. Why would you take it away? But I'm going to trust you because you do all things well. I don't know about you, but that helped me. He does all things well. So what could we learn from our text, John chapter 21? In verse 18 and 23, well, two things we could learn from that. Our number one business is to follow Jesus, no matter what. No matter what, our number one business is to follow Jesus. Number two, we must keep following Jesus faithfully to whatever he called us to do, even if it means dying for him. Even if it means dying for him like Peter, amen? We must follow his will. Whatever he takes us is going to take us to suffering. I, 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 I guarantee you that. But he's there for you, amen? We got to follow him no matter what, whatever he takes us, because even if he means suffering and dying for him, because even if you don't understand his ways, because his ways are higher than our ways, anyhow, he's smarter than us. Amen? And look at John, last verse, look at John chapter 8. Look at John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. Our main business is to follow the Lord. That's the main focus. Our main business is just keep, even if you don't understand, you keep following the Lord. He does all things well. He's not going to mislead you. He's not going to misguide you, amen? You could trust him, amen? I put God through the test for 25 years. He has never disappointed me. I disappoint him. I get off, I get off course. Look at John chapter 8. Notice verse 12. We're supposed to follow him. That's our main business. Just like he told Peter. None of your business. What I, what's my plan for John? You follow me. You focus on me. You follow my steps, not John's steps. And, and in John chapter 8, notice in verse 12 what Jesus talks about those who make their main focus to follow him. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. You can't go wrong by following the light of the world, right? He that follow me shall not what? Walk in darkness. You're not going to stumble, amen? Walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I want God's light. He's, he's the word of God, right? He's the, he's the lamp unto my feet. You can't go wrong when you follow him wholeheartedly. What is our main business this morning? Follow him. Follow him. You can't go wrong. And by the way, if you're truly, how many of you consider yourself a true follower of Christ? Or, you know what the Bible said? Let me give you a proof. Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Those of you who raise your hand, are you really following him? He said, if you follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Are you fishing men? Should we try again, raising our hand? No, we're not going to go there. Just examine your own heart. Are you really following him? Because if you're following him, he says, I'll make you fishers of men. Amen? Don't call yourself a true follower of Christ. I'm not going to call myself if I'm not fishing man. What is that? Reach the lost. Give the gospel to lost people. Amen? Try to reach lost people. I appreciate uh, a group went out yesterday after, after the ladies' uh, fellowship, you know, and they say, hey, pastor, go follow this person. And somebody gave their heart to Jesus Christ. Somebody listen. Praise the Lord. We don't know who means it. I don't even know if you meant it. I know I meant it. So stop questioning, oh, did he mean it? We don't know that. That's not our job. Our job is to give them the gospel and preach the gospel, amen? That's our job, amen? God will take care of the life changing. 
Amen? That's not your job. You can't change nobody. You can't change nobody. Only Christ could do that. Amen? That's his business. So we need to just mind our own business. And our main business is to follow Christ. Amen? Stand on our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you really following the Lord? Or are you following your feelings and your emotions? Your own carnal thinking? You know, your own puny mind? We need to follow the, the one that's smarter than you and I. He's all wise. We're dumb. Amen? We're weak. He's all powerful. We don't know anything. He knows everything. Follow thou me. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed, and the invitation is open. If you're not even saved this morning, why don't you follow him by faith? Stop trusting your own human words. Stop trusting church membership and trusting yourself. Why don't you just follow him by faith alone? Follow him by faith as your savior, and he will save you. Amen? And then after you accept him by faith as your savior, then go live by faith. Stop questioning God's authority.